So you think you can manage? I would challenge anyone, anyone, to say that they could do a worse job than Joe Girardi in the Philadelphia Phillies uniform. We are So That You Think You Can Manage podcast. We are a two-person podcast tonight. I am joined only with Biscuit. It's okay, though. He's a fan favorite. And I am Shane. We are talking about our 21-20 and 20 Philadelphia Phillies. I do not have a single clue how this team is over 500 right now. I'll be totally honest. I have been uh, about as angry as you can possibly be. I'm even angry when we win. I, I'm angry when good things happen. Uh, this This season has been a culmination of the... 10 plus year playoff drought at this point. And, uh, and things are brewing, things are brewing hard. Things are brewing in the Phillies dugout. And I think that's where we're going to start. Gene or I have played for every freaking team on the planet and everyone kicks me out because I'm a problem child decides to blow up just a bit and act like a toddler at second base against Joe Girardi. You biscuit are his biggest defender. What and off. it really bothers me. <laughs> at least of our, at least of us three. So let's start with that. Uh, when we sit here and we discuss the, the so you think you can manage thing, we, we initially thought this was going to be a bit of a gimmick, but you know we we believe in in managers here. You know we believed in Gabe Kavler, we believed in Joe Girardi when he when he came here, uh, but things are not going hot. That was a really bad look, and it was an even worse look because the broadcast continued to to speak about that, and then it even carried through to the post game. And the way that that entire situation was kind of diagnosed and shoved aside by Joe Girardi. So let's start first with the incident in, in itself. Leading in, Phillies play horrendous defense. Joe Girardi finally just has his moment where he says, just catch the ball. You just got to catch the ball. Gene Segura had the opportunity to, I don't know, catch the ball. And I know what he was attempting to do. And the game moves very quickly. I understand that he was looking to allow that to bounce and work a double play. I would have done the same thing unless you look at still not yet super thin Vlad Guerrero on first base, who is drafting a side would have had a double play there regardless if you catch the ball or allow it to bounce. Now heat of the moment, that thing happens. Let's go to the incident itself inside that duck out. Do you blame in this particular instance the manager for attempting, or at least what we believe, in holding Gene Segura accountable and bringing some conversation to something that is clearly a clubhouse issue at this point? Or do you blame Gene Segura for the outburst and the way that he reacted to whatever it was that Girardi said? I mean, look, at the end of the day, I don't really blame anyone for how they acted in that situation. In Gene Segura's case, we don't know what was said. You know, very well may not have been the best way to handle the situation. And maybe part of the reason Joe Girardi was so hesitant to really elaborate is maybe because he felt the same way and was just frustrated with himself. But look, that that's just me speculating. But, you know... I don't mind Girardi calling Gene Segura out in that situation. He had the miscue late in the game the night before with him and Maton like out in shallow center field where the ball dropped between them. Um, and then to see that happen, you know, not once, but let alone twice in the entire game, but for it to happen and for that issue to happen, um, look, it, it's unacceptable. Now, with that being said, I don't think – that should be much of an indication on how Gene Segura has played so far this season. He's played very well and has honestly been one of the better defenders on this team. Look, stuff happens, but I don't, I, I, I also don't criticize Joe Girardi for calling him out in that situation. And I kind of like the fact that it was someone like Gene Segura because Gene's a veteran. He's been around longer than most guys in the league. Um, he's certainly one of the older players on this baseball team. And, you know, for better or for worse, you know, he's someone who I don't think is necessarily a clubhouse leader, but he's a big figure in that clubhouse. He's a household name. People know who he is. People know how he plays the game. Um, so I don't I don't mind Girardi making, you know, going at him specifically. But for really Joe Girardi to act the way he did after the game and for him to kind of, um, you know, poo poo the reporters and give them a lot of attitude for just doing their jobs. I think that was the most disheartening thing to see. Uh, that was the, certainly the, the thing that I took away from it was his attitude. And like I said, at the end of the day, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, blame Segura or ba- blame Girardi for whatever happened between the two of them. But like the way really Girardi carried himself after that game, 
like that's I thought everyone wanted Joe, like a manager like Joe Girardi for a lot of things, but also for you wanted him to be a really transparent communicator, an effective communicator, which is everyone uh, everyone said Gabe Kapler lacked, and it's just you're not seeing that right now. So do you think, and, I, and I'm curious with that last statement there, Joe Girardi's clear, he's clearly a passionate guy. He loves the game. He's been around the game for a long time in various different capacities. This cannot be easy. Last year, dealing with the bullpen that he that he was given by Matt Klentak and company, and to watch that and say, there's not a single move I can make that's going to work. Like, I just know we're going to lose this baseball game. Like, I would it would behoove me to say, Scott Kingery, go out there and throw that 62-mile-an-hour knuckle fastball type thing like that was the state of last year this year they can't field anything and again we've talked about it before uh about guys being out of position or guys just really not being that talented of of defensive uh, baseball players in general but do you think as a guy who is that passionate about the game of baseball to witness what he has witnessed over back-to-back years here in philadelphia that that press conference and that interaction with gene segura was kind of just him bubbling over like this is enough is enough right now and he doesn't know what direction to go in well yeah he's certainly under that stress i mean look his job's in question right now the team has not been performing well in any facets really i think the only you know you could say the bullpens made made baby step improvements but the offense and the defense has certainly taken a step back sure the rotation's been fine but like look this team's really scuffling on a, on a lot of different levels and his job has been in question he's done some questionable things managing that have you know prompted a lot of people to call him alford and rightfully so he has not been good and also like it's also the matter of the fact that I kind of lost my train of thought here, but um, there's just you you bring a guy like that in for accountability and it's just not there right now. And so, sure, he might be bubbling over, but like you, you kind of had to know that you, you weren't managing the Yankees again. Like you weren't getting a Yankees team that's stacked. Like you're going to, you got a team that was going to need work. The talent's there. And I always like the talent is there on paper. It's a very talented team that should resemble something close to a playoff roster. The talent's there, but it's not going to be a cakewalk. And maybe he didn't realize it that he was, you know, he can't just manage willy nilly and hope everything works out because you have a Derek Jeter. You have those types of players. Like obviously Jeter's probably not the best person to just jump to, but like those types of stars, you, you, really don't have outside of like two or three guys so i i you know yeah he's frustrated but like it's on you too dude like you can't just you need to adapt to the team that you have and the way baseball is played now and you haven't seen that from joe at all yeah we've talked about it again at nauseum through through our first three episodes here so you think you might so you can jesus christ that is a <laughs> tough title to say I hope you guys have better success saying it, right? I hope the listeners have better success saying so you think you can manage than what we do. Um, But uh, we, again, we've, we've said it at nauseum that, that he has been so underwhelming thus far. And that's in every facet that's in decision-making that's in lineup making that's in basic uh, understanding of rules and things like things slip, like stuff happens, but the kinds of slips that you're seeing, should absolutely never happen to a guy with the with the tenure of in this game as a Joe Girardi. And <clears throat> now again, we, it, we we have to be honest. We we don't know if all of this happened throughout his time in New York, but it was just overshadowed by the fact that he had a powerhouse roster. Maybe he wasn't that great of a manager. Now again, he took a very a. a non payroll non existent payroll Marlins team and made them relevant. Um, you know, so I'm not prepared to say that he's bad, but he's been very underwhelming. Um, but let's kind of go through some of the things that have made Joe Girardi's job that much more challenging. So we've talked already a, a bit about the defense, but let's dive in just a little bit more. So in that last series alone, they had six errors on paper and they probably had another six or seven misplayed balls or generous hits uh, that, that were, you know, added to that total there this team has been bad and it isn't it's guys that you expect to make better plays like you expect gene segura to make honestly both the plays that 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 he kind of butched there uh in that last game but then there's a whole other side of that where 
your corner infielders are not great. Your left field position is old, fast in the field. Really nice month hitting for Andrew McCutcheon, by the way, for anyone paying attention. Hitting over 300 in the month of May so far with five home runs. So good for him for writing that part of the ship. Hopefully defense comes next. But right now with this team, is there anything that you see? And with absolutely no bench. Your superstar's hurt. Your catcher, who you just paid for five years, he's not super well. I guess we can call Herrera the everyday center fielder now. I'm not super happy about it, but he's taken that that job at this point and solidified it as his own. But this team, what can you do? Like I, I've talked about it so much with people, and I genuinely do not know. And this is not in defense of of Girardi. But I will say, just in defense of the situation, what can you do? Last night we we were talking about Vince Velasquez was probably going to come in that game as a fielder again, which you can't because he's one of your better pitchers. What a year this has been. <laughs> oh, God. But what would you do right now? Or is there anything you can think to do to make his job easier? I mean, like, I'll start with the defense. What's going to change there? You know, the majority of your stars in your everyday lineup are not good defenders. You, you know, you just went through the corner infielders, not good. Segura, probably the best infielder on the diamond, and he's not even anything special. Didi just showing so much at every level of this game. Didi is just showing so much, so much decline, which is really, really upsetting to see. Um, Kutch in question defensively. Herrera, not really the the best defender, you know, obviously hasn't done anything too boneheaded so far, but we've seen it in the past when he's been up with us before. And then Bryce, Bryce isn't a terrible defender, but he's certainly not having a great year defensively. He's also hurt, and he was also hurt a bit last year as well, so that's certainly not helping his case um, in the outfield. So I, I don't know what gets better there, Shane. Like, you know, maybe if you try to bring someone in, if you're going to try to move someone to get a better bat in the lineup at some point before the deadline, if they're even in that fucking position, which, <laughs> you know, that that could be that could be a crapshoot in and of itself. Um, but like, look, the rotation has been fine. You mentioned, you know, Ace Vinny now, Cy, Cy Velasquez um, <laughs> on the mound. He's going to absolutely be horrendous the rest of the season now because I said that about him. But, um, you know, there have been things that have been good. You know, they're not a game over 500 now just just by happenstance. Like, they, they have had things that are playing well. I really like Nick Maton. Um, kind of to jump on him for a second. He is exactly the kind of player I wanted Scott Kingery to be. Like, he doesn't have to, you know – really walk a lot he doesn't have to hit for super crazy power but a guy who can you know get big hits make solid contact and play kind of uh all over the infield and if he you know takes that next step maybe in the outfield as well as a super utility guy um so so he's been impressive but good to, to really go back to the negatives um the offense man like you need another bat in there you have too many guys scuffling and with bryce and jt hurt a lot this season missing a lot of time now um, you, you need more, you need more firepower. You're not going to have days like yesterday when they really come back in it, even though they continue to screw the pooch on that game. But, um, offensive and de- offensively and defensively big yikes. I don't know what gets better anytime soon. So let's move to that offense piece. Then you mentioned it a little bit on the defensive side of your argument. And I think it does carry over into the offensive as well. So there's two two sides to this. They are 21 and 20 right now with Bryce Harper being hurt for a vast majority of the season, or at least not not well, not the, the Bryce Harper we would expect. JT coming back from the thumb, also now having the 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 knee issue, um, just an awkward place to get hit by a pitch there, and then some other nagging things. Right now, TD apparently is going through random days where he can't swing a bat. Ah, oh, shit, he got COVID. In the middle of the show, the Phillies gave him COVID. It was my drink. Blame Minute Maid. Minute Maid? Minute Maid Lemonade. Minute Maid Lemonade. Boy, you sound like you're dying. That's awesome. I tried. I tried. But we could say it was the Phillies. The Phillies do make me sad. Sure. So. That, well, there you go. They make us unwell. <laughs> um, 
but again, b- back to that Hargi Medidi, <laughs> there are days that he can't even hold the bat because his arm is swelling up so much. Uh, he's obviously missed games here and there uh, with that elbow injury again, or, or just elbow soreness, they're calling it. Um, the, the team somehow is is over 500. Is this the type of situation where there is just enough in a very typical Philadelphia, any sports team in Philadelphia fashion, doing just enough to say, we don't need to make any major moves. All we need to do is get healthy and get right. And then you're going to really see what this team can do when Bryce is good, when JT is good, when Didi's back at short. Um, you know, and then suddenly you feel confident again. I am not that way. So my question to you, Biscuit, is this, would it behoove this team to jump on the trade talk immediately? And if so, what position or positions are you immediately looking to upgrade for both offensive and defensive reasons? I, I think you would jump to an outfielder, you know, specifically someone who could either play left or definitely play center. But look, w- w- with Kutch turning around and um, Odubo performing fine enough at the plate right now. Um, Jesus, you're know, going to talk yourself into no moves. I'm not talking myself into <laughs> no moves. I'm saying that I would rather see this team try to target the bench a little bit and maybe move a few guys and get a few guys to fill those those holes there. I love Brad Miller. I think Brad Miller's fine, but let's be real, Matt Joyce isn't it. Um, Everything they bet on in the offseason to be you know, depth pieces are not it. And Scott Scott Kingery, look, man, um, Scott Kingery's been awful. He's been awful really since he's been caught up minus Birth. half – Minus half of a season in 2019, but um, you, you need more there. So I, I honestly, I don't mind if you don't go after any starters. I think at the deadline you might want to try to go for an impact bat, maybe move someone who I think that's a conversation for a different day because I don't have a good answer right now that I think I would confidently stick with. But definitely someone on that bench. I think those are the areas to make moves to get some guys in, specifically someone with some right-handed pop who could kind of complement Brad Miller in that regard. Um, who who that bat's going to be, I don't know. But um, that's who I would primarily focus on. And then you could also get someone defensively who could sub in later in games if you're up with a lead, maybe rest cutch the rest of the way. You Similar to how if you see like they're really up in games that they'll sit Bryce or sit um, sit JT, doing that with maybe Didi or or Boom or, or um, Kutch, I, I, I think that would be something that really benefits the team, um, especially heading down the stretch run. Yeah, so look, I, I... – 100% agree that the bench there needs to be bolstered. I mean, what they've bet on in this offseason, what they attempted to sell us, and we all we we were all there for it. We we saw Matt Joyce hit a home run on opening day here a couple of years ago. Like we were like, sure, I'm all in, no problem. Give me that guy. Uh, but we didn't envision him when he played being in the leadoff spot, as Andrew mentioned on previous shows. Like it's this team, and we're again we last night. The first inning didn't it was not even concluded and we were out of actual baseball players outside of pitchers. Like that's that's impossible to me. That first of all, it's organizational malpractice. Shane, Go ahead, Biscuit. Have you, you you now you're a little older than me. No shame in that game. That's you've right. also watched you've also watched a lot more baseball than I have. Have you ever seen something like this where it feels like you enter like like what why isn't Didi on the IL? Like, he's clearly injured. He's been out for almost a week now. He's not healthy. Why is he Why is he taking up a roster spot? Like, not for nothing, you can't have situations like this. Like, this is – and this – it's just, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. And I've never felt like I've seen anything like that where you enter a game and literally no one is available because everyone is hurt, but no one is actually that injured to go on the injured list. It's just kind of like it's it, it, it's just like silly to me. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that. Like, like, what do you think? Absolutely not. I've never seen anything like that for two reasons. One, I genuinely don't ever remember bodies breaking down in the way that they do now. Uh, in this game, and, and I do believe that there's a, there's a difference there uh, in the ways the bodies kind of main, uh, manage the workload. Um, two, we're just a stupid organization, and we 
just seem to recreate ways to be dumb. It's unbelievable. So if you would have told me that, that like, look, I get it. <clears throat> if Bryce only needs a day or so, which it definitely does not look like he only needs a day, that guy needs some time. Um, and he's look, that's your biggest asset by, by every single account that you can't, the fact that he entered that game last night, I, 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 holy shit, I'm so pissed off. We'll get to that. I'm sure later, but it, going into that and, and you have JT, you got Bryce, you got DD all not well. And just as you mentioned, it's, we'll, we'll use DD's case specifically. It's not like DD's a, just a world beater right now where he's coming out there and he's a key cog to both the offensive and defensive success of your team. He's not, he's really struggling. Even if he's not that hurt, it behooves him to get a little bit of a mental breather too. go ahead, send him off, bring yourself in another bench who that bench piece is at any given point. Who the hell knows right now? We don't have anyone that's worth talking about, but at least there's a body. At least you don't have to sit there and literally have the thought we're going to see Vince Velasquez in the field again. And as fun as that is, that's the only time I am excited to see Vince Velasquez, even through his, his spurt of quality pitching. And he has been very good for three starts. I still only like to watch him play the field. I don't ever need to see it, though. It should never come to that. So, again, like t- to me, I understand the, the whole thought of I, I don't want to burn 10 days of a guy on an IL if he only needs two or three. But if three or four guys go down and that are not playable for nine innings, at a certain point, you got to say, all right, well, who who can we who can we actually put on the IL right now? Even though they may not really need the 10 days, we can't afford to go that short on the bench. And uh, the fact that they did last night uh, and have been doing so for quite a bit this year um, is just uh it's unbelievable. It's again, organizational malpractice. If that's Joe's decision, if that's fuck, man, it just, I'm so angry at the state of this baseball team, despite being 21 and 20. Um, and it's hard, you know, it's to, I usually, I usually get till, you know, a couple weeks after the, uh, after the all-star break there before I hit this point, but this team has beaten me down so much. And and I'm not ashamed to say that. And, you know, I, I believe it's a difficult, it's a difficult product to watch night in and night out when you feel like nothing's really changed big picture wise in over a decade, the same shit that we're seeing and the same shit that's here. Um, so that's, what's really, really upsetting. So with some of those injuries, you've had to manipulate things a, a bit and you've had to think kind of different scenarios. So I, I do want to run this one by you. I am not, a, and look, our CTP guys over there on the other baseball show that we have, the Chasing the Pennant Pod, one of them, several of them, believe that Andrew Knapp is, and they just <laughs> buy into other podcast bits because they're cheap hosts. That's what they are. Calling you out because you're not going to listen to the show anyway. <coughs> <laughs> but they believe wholeheartedly in uh, in Andrew Knapp, and his, another podcast host told them to. I will say... There is value to him behind the plate, and there is value to protecting JT and his innings behind the plate. Reese Hoskins is like the least sexy, decent baseball player I've ever seen in my life. I could, If I never watched him in a Phillies uniform again, I, I'd, I'd be pretty okay with that. And I understand he could carry it for several weeks. I truly do. He has that ability, but he also has the ability to hit 057 for the six weeks following that with one home run. And he plays shit defense. If there was a way to regularly put Andrew Knapp back there, a significantly better game caller, I acknowledge this, certainly a slight step down on the defensive, full picture defensive aspect of the catching position, but handles it fairly well in his own right. Zach Wheeler believes that he can start literally anywhere else in the base uh, in Major League Baseball. Hilarious to me, but we'll roll with it for the sake of the argument. If there was a way to get both of those guys on the field and you get JT some more time at first base and a more consistent bat in JT out there at first base than what Reese Hoskins is, would you do that? And if you could do that, would you then suddenly say, you know what? All right, Marshan's going to be up. We're going to constantly carry a third catcher because now an already short bench has taken a guy who's going to never play anywhere other than behind the plate. What's the argument outside of, 
Matt being a better game caller that, that you have, that really warrants him much more starting time or as much starting time as JT. Um, he's, the only yeah, one is the yeah. only argument to be made is is just to save JT's health and <laughs> and that's you know. fine and that's fine and I and I, you know I, I admire I, I have no problem with with Nap starting every fifth day or catching every Eflin day and getting those regular um not regular but you know getting that consistent playing time where he's going to see the lineup or at least once or twice in a given week um I, I'm totally fine with that because he is a solid catcher. You know, he's not JT Romuto in all of their facets, but he does call a good game. Uh, but I, I don't think really sh- we should sacrifice Reese Hoskins or JT's playing time um, over over either of those guys to put Nap in just because Nap isn't as good as JT. At the end of the day, JT's a better defender. Um, he's a better offensive player by far. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, what I would rather see is JT becoming a better game caller, which, you know, Baseball is an evolving sport. You always got to learn different things and get better at different things and work on different things. JT should, you know, try to adapt and, and get a little better in that regard. But in all of their facets, he is the better catcher. And um, at the end of the day, even with Reese Hoskins, sure, he's streaky, but I trust his bat more than Knapp's. Um I, I trust, obviously, JT's bat more than Knapp. I, I love Andrew Knapp. Uh, I, I've been cynical of him in the past, and I think that those come from – kind of a little bit of a place of ignorance, not understanding the value that a guy like Knapp does bring. And I, 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 I think there's truth to Wheeler's comment. Look, he's a very talented guy. I think he could have some some prolonged success. I don't know what that could be as an everyday starting catcher on another team. I'm sure there's someone out there who would take a stab on him in that regard as well. But um, he's our backup catcher, and he's a solid backup catcher, and I like having him in that role. I'll say... I'll say this. So in look, in no respect was that question or argument supposed to be framed in a way. And if it was taken that way, Biscuit, my apologies, stating that Andrew Knapp has any business being mentioned in the same league as JT. It was oh, more no. so. Can we is there a way to it? Like, is Andrew Knapp's presence in the lineup more valuable than him being on the bench? Um, and and I think he answered that pretty, pretty thoroughly throughout that. I will say with Andrew Knapp, because I, too, I, I've never been an Andrew Knapp fan until this offseason. Everyone knew JT was it was the apple of the Phillies front office side. Like the, that was the guy they wanted so long as the numbers were going to work out. But Andrew Knapp, understandably so, had to take a lot of really tough interview questions in that offseason. And he took every single one of them saying, look, I, I'm I'm preparing every single day. And this is the most cliche thing you can say, but there's a way that you can articulate it and present it that has you believing in it. And, you know, simply stating, you know, he's preparing every single day as if he was the starting catcher. And he believes that despite how talented JT is and acknowledging JT is the best in the game at that position in all things, that he could still come in there and be a successful piece to this puzzle. And if they get JT, then he's willing to come back and take whatever role that was going to have for him and play to any capacity that he was going to be here. And to me, it was such a professional stand-up answer, and it was one that I could believe the just the genuine nature of the response, not just a I'm saying this because I have to type of thing. And that's where things started to kind of change for me. And I, too, started paying attention to what Andrew Knapp brings to a game, and and I do believe there is a lot of talent there. I don't, I wouldn't go so far as Wheeler to say I, I believe he could start in all these other organizations. I don't. Uh, ultimately, that bad is just not consistent enough to keep you there. Um but I think he's a really, really talented guy. And I think he's going to make a great Philadelphia Phillies manager one day. Uh, I, I think that's where I'm going with Andrew Knapp. A smart dude who can call a good game uh, and just seems to really get people to to, to buy into him. Um, I'd like that for Knapp. I, dude, I think it'd be cool. I do think catchers, outside of the one we have managing us right now, make some some pretty good uh, front office and management um pieces I, I just think that there's a they have a deeper understanding of the game um and i believe the catcher is one of those positions where you, you're constantly seeing the changes of the game um and i do believe that that those pieces guys like andrew knapp uh in, in a future you know career as manager of the philadelphia phillies um i believe that there's an argument to be had that he'd be significantly more successful than joe hmm. but <clears throat> So let's uh, let's let's shift to something that this is a conversation I don't typically like to have 
I'll, I'll own this one. I, we were, so Andrew was supposed to be on this show. Uh, and this is a conversation I was going to put for Biscuit and Andrew to kind of discuss with one another. And I was going to just patiently sit this one out. Um, mercifully, I'm sure for the listeners to have less speak time from me. Uh, but it can't be ignored any longer. And, and I do acknowledge this. Aaron Nola, you're a legitimate ace. People want to say that he isn't an ace because he, he can't perform on the road. And, and, and I hear that it's the numbers are glaring. And that's why we have to talk about this right now. What do you think it is for a guy like that? A guy who can look just so unbelievably dominant and in control of a game at home. And you go on the road and it's almost like out the gate. You can see he's not the same guy, whether it's a mental thing, whether it's a, the way that he prepares. Maybe he just needs sleeping in his own bed. I don't know what it is, but at this point, it's been three straight seasons of underwhelming road performances from Aaron Nola. And that's super concerning to me because you get to October, the guy already says he only likes pitching in, in humid weather. The guy from from where he is. It's ridiculous. Here we come to Philadelphia. You want me to pitch him in a postseason where it's going to be 12 degrees in October? And well, now he can't pitch on the road? He said he likes to pitch in humid weather. That doesn't mean he can't pitch when it's cold, Shane. Doesn't mean he can't pitch when it's cold. But look, I... I I get it. It's a concern. I, the numbers are there to back it up. He's not as consistent at home as he is on the road. Personally, I haven't noticed it as much. And also, I, I'm, I'm just – I get it. It's there. It is a legitimate concern. I don't have much to say about it other than that. I believe in Aaron Nola. I think he's a very talented guy. I think he is one of the best pitchers in baseball, and he's definitely an ace. I know that's not really the conversation we're having. But I think in a big moment when it's his time to really thrive, not these games where everything else is falling to pieces around him, but he's really, you know, if he had like a mediocre start or a mess start, the team's just not there. That whole team is not going to win around him. And just because he doesn't have the solid start, like most other pitchers do either, um, you know, he's kind of the guy who takes the the brunt of the, the focus. Um but he's a talent. I think when it's his time in those moments to really thrive, he's going to step it up. I have no doubt in my mind about that. I just think the guy's too talented. So you made a, a several points in that that have always kind of been my stance. That the pitcher, especially the ace of his staff, it's like a quarterback, going to wear a lot more of that loss despite all of the other shit that might happen around him on those days. The Philadelphia Phillies as a whole are not good on the road. Have not been in years. This team is fundamentally fucked. I have never watched a shittier team. And I have coached 15-year-olds. I've coached 13-year-olds. And they all eat my ass. This team is just as bad. It's unbelievable what you watch out there. So they do make a starting pitcher's job infinitely more difficult. And I believe that if you're going to lose that consistently as a club and as an organization on the road, that it is unfair to sit there and put the bulk of those issues on one particular starting pitcher, just because he holds the title of an ace. So I do think that there is a bit of an unrealistic nature to that. But I, unlike you, I do notice a difference. When I watch, I do genuinely see, and he may be pressing because he's aware of this. That's a strong possibility of, I need to win these road games because, or I need to be perfect on the road because this team as a whole is just a train wreck. I don't know, but there is something different watching him on the road versus at home. Like I have an excitement about watching him in Citizens Bank Park. I have just an I watch with an air of caution on the road. I think it certainly has to do with that comment you made just there. He understands the nature of this team and that a lot of things go wrong for the Phillies when they're on the road. It's not necessarily a, you know, a cakewalk. So I do think he does press a little bit in those regards, but also like we alluded to this. The team doesn't help him. You look at that game yesterday in Dunedin, Florida, and the defense wasn't there from the get-go. They were just – excuse me, the game on – um he pitched on Saturday, excuse me. The game on Saturday, the defense wasn't there. They made a few miscues that didn't help him with runners on. Um, I'm sure that has happened on the road to also inflate that – earned run average that hasn't been so great on the road like there's things that just don't work out for his favor and also like the starts aren't immaculate like going back to his start on Saturday it obviously wasn't the best start 
But what did he go? Six and three runs? Like, that's not terrible by any means. And like I said, at the end of the day, the numbers are going to be there. They're going to be there for Aaron Nola. And, like, I had this conversation with one of my coworkers today. Shout out to Christian. Uh, listen to the podcast. But um, I had this conversation with one of my coworkers today. I'm not going to sit here and have this conversation about Aaron Nola not being an ace, Aaron Nola being this, Aaron Nola being that, when he's not Chase Anderson with, like, a 7.10 earned run average or he's not Adam Hazley or Odubo Herrera before he got a little hot or um or uh like um oh God, who, uh, yeah or like you know what he just he, there's consistency with Nola and he's good these other guys are a shit show and they're the ones really blowing this team apart not Nola and they're not the ones getting the slander it's Nola because he's the ace and he needs to wear it on the chin and that's fine but I'm not going to sit here for the slander I love it. I wish – so this is where – so Andrew, just for the listeners who have carried over with us over here to this podcast now. Yeah, come at me, Andrew. So <laughs> – well, Andrew has mentioned that he believes that we should transition to some video shows as well or at least posting some of this. And that moment right there was one I genuinely wish that we had video for and that all of you – I mean behind a snowflakey screen with a background, it's just a floating biscuit head. And just hands randomly come flailing out because of the pixelation of behind it. It moves all awkwardly. It looks like a Lego. It's so weird. And uh, I think that would have been video gold for, for us here. But um, so you alluded to so much there. And there's a lot to unpack. So we're going to bring this over to, to one kind of final point before we sit here and talk a little bit about the next uh, or the upcoming series. I believe so. This is a notoriously difficult city for anyone in sports and we make it so because we as fans are we're so passionate about everything that has to do with any of our teams here in the city and because of the the kind of northeastern attitude that's just so prevalent everywhere like we're kind of dicks and we get it but it also allows like our media to embrace that and then be a caricature of that and take it to the nth degree one of the things that I always find interesting, and I've had this conversation on previous podcasts before other podcasts, and I still have it uh, to this day. I believe that the that those who speak about these teams have more influence than they than than what they could even imagine. When you're watching a, a, an an older any older broadcaster in any sport, if they dislike the changes of that sport, it's tough to watch a game that you might be into, but all you're hearing is how bad the product is eventually you start to think maybe this product is bad what we are seeing here and if we're being if we're calling this as just a spade a spade this is a deeply deeply flawed baseball team they are not a talented or they may be talented but they're not performing to any type of consistency here and it's starting to get to the point where even those who do not typically did you just do a line <laughs> no i sneezed <laughs> once again another video moment i wish we had i i, I don't do cocaine that's very good. You work with <laughs> almost children, people who are barely not children any longer. Um, but one of the things that we deal with is even the, the calmest and coolest of heads that typically come out there are so done with this team. And they're so fed up. We hear it. I mean, even McCarthy, uh, who is one of the most joyous just figures that you can watch. And I love him. I think Tom McCarthy's great, by the way. Just if you don't come at me, I don't give a shit. The guy's awesome. Um, you see it with Kruk and and even Salisbury. It gets to that point, and it's it's so hard when you just keep hearing how bad this thing is. I find it impossible to view it as anything other than bad. Do you think that we are all now collectively as a city getting to the point where we're like enough is enough? Do whatever the fuck you have to do to make this a winning roster. I don't care who you have to bring in. I don't care what kind of character they are. I don't care the shit that they've done. Odubel Herrera's back in center field, so clearly they don't care too, too much about some things. At what point right now are we all just done? And like that lifeless, like you picture September baseball when you know you're out of it. You're watching, but it's just sad. And you're like, you can't get emotionally invested. 
And I feel like we're all we're ramping up to that point of anger at 21 and 20, by the way, still mildly in this thing early on. And we're just hitting that peak. And how much longer before we start that decline of. I'm beat like this team has beat me to nothing. Where do you feel like we're all at collectively as a city now? You know, what's marvelous about this topic, Shane ties into my roundtable discussion so uh if you wouldn't mind i think we're gonna have to segue right into that after this one um go for but, it i i mean yeah look, look it's it's something new every year with this team like since 2018 really obviously there were a lot lower expectations in 2018 but even that season when it felt like they were going to sneak into the playoffs they had that little run where they performed well for a couple months and really before that september collapse looked like they were going to easily walk their way to the uh national league east crown um but outside of that year like it has not been fun it has been a very Back and forth baseball team uh, at 500, above 500, back down to 500, uh, below 500, back up to 500. It's like a vicious cycle. And something's been wrong every year. You go back to 2019, the bats didn't do enough. The um, rotation certainly didn't perform well outside of NOLA. And NOLA didn't even perform well that season either. Um, then you go to 2020, the bullpen you know, becomes a shit show dumpster fire and is, you know, the worst bullpen ever in major league professional history. Um, and now this year, the offense goes to shit again. Everyone's injured and the fucking defense is abysmal. So it's something new every year. What shows anyone at this point in time that the Phillies are going to be nothing more like this? Because I haven't seen anything Really, since since 2019, when they were 10 games over 500, I didn't even see it in the pandemic shortened season. I always knew something was going to come back and bite this team in the ass. And literally since June of 2019, I have not seen anything to me that tells me, OK, this Phillies team is going to go on a run. They're going to make it to the playoffs that they are going to you know, go on a deep playoff run. There's been nothing that shows me that there's nothing. And what what saves that? What do you do? Blow up your already shitty farm system, make it so much worse. And what happens if that doesn't work? You blow up the farm system, bring a bunch of other dudes in. And what if you still don't make the playoffs? Then it's all really for nothing. So that's not a good strategy. You, you really can't sign that many players. You have Bryce for another decade plus paying him $25 million, which I'm obviously fine with. But you have so many guys tied up now. You don't really have the money. You might have money for like one big splash. That's it. But that's not going to fix it. That's not going to save the sinking ship. So like I said, this leads me to my roundtable conversation. How much more can we take? L l nothing is really like at this point in time, unless the players that we have right now get better, nothing is going to fix this team. So fa fast forward a few months. It's July. We're at the trade deadline. And let's face it. We're probably either in this 500 limbo or we're probably performing worse than that since, you know, go going how it's trending right now. I think you start selling. I think you identify some people that you think you can move and try to get whatever you can back to maybe fix this farm system in such a minuscule way. If that's the case and we're really out of it, if there's someone or a couple players right now that you want to move, who would you identify right off the bat to try to swing in a deal? <clears throat> um. See, it's hard. I, I think at this point you'd be selling so low on so many different pieces uh, that it doesn't exactly behoove you to sell now. You need some guys to get to really get hot. I think one piece that you could sell now, even though he just had an explosion, is Gene Segura. Yeah, you know, there are there are teams that that would sit there and say, you know what? And this is crazy to be having this conversation on on May seventeenth. Um, but again, that uh, just as we've mentioned, like this is the point of like how much more can we take? Like we've seen the same thing. Um, I will say this about this entire topic here uh, to me in, in no particular order, Gene Segura uh, is definitely one DD. If he gets himself right and Reese Hoskins, um, you know, to, to me, like those are the pieces that immediately say, sure, if you can move them, go for it. Um, I don't really think Kutch would bring you much, if anything, uh, at this point. And I think he's such a good clubhouse guy that, to me, it, it behooves the organization to keep him around. So that's why I don't have him there. Um, but of the regular 
the regular guys there, those are the ones that, that I'd probably look to move. Um, I mentioned it on a previous podcast, too. Uh, as much as I was very wrong about Eflin and very impressed with him, I think that guy could land you a major haul. Um, and I don't know that I trust his body long term to provide the type of success he's shown this year. Um, so I think if the package was right of the three real pitchers we have there, that's the guy I'd probably ship. Um, but here's the thing. We don't have a good farm system, and that's been well documented. But we had horrendous scouting and, and developing uh, and development. And we had a guy who, who was making the decisions on draft night who was such an asshole. I very much so do trust what is now in place to put that in that influx of actual youth and talent. I believe it used to be like, who do you hit on in the first round? Who's there that you might get lucky on in, in rounds two through like four, two through five. But beyond that, count on one hand, the amount of guys that are just coming out of there for you. Uh, I believe that we're going to find some guys there. that are going to be really valuable pieces. Like I genuinely believe that we're, we're going to be able to take guys in random rounds that are just going to be dudes who come out of the pen with high spin rights, high velocity. Maybe their shelf life is three years, but who cares? We'll have five other guys that are going to just flip right on out. I believe that there's going to be enough pieces for us to develop. And really all we need to do is flex the wallet. Like it's not going to happen this year, probably, but but off season, maybe next year's deadline. Like I believe that there are, there are pieces that we could go after. There are pieces, off season pieces in particular that we can pay top dollar for. And I think we'll be okay. And then you just find some dudes that work out. You know, the Dodgers have been doing it and the Dodgers have been good for a decade. I just, I don't think that saves us. We've just thrown money away the last three off seasons. And sure, all, not you know, there have been some busts there. Like you want more from yeah, Koch, you, you want more. But the point is, it, it's not anything. What's going to go back to your first to your first point? What's going to make this team a competent major league team that can win consistently is de- de- developing a better farm system and churning out that talent, whether it's you, like you said, relievers who have good spin rate can come up, even if they're only good for a few. So years, th- those could be, you know, years that they're on a run and have big years. And then, like you said, they're, they're going to continue to churn out good talent. That's what we need. And that isn't happening anytime soon. You don't know if that's going to even happen within the next three years. So I, I don't, my issue Shane is, what are we really waiting for? It's not – we. this is a win now with a team that can't win overnight. Like that's the issue right now. Everything is so go, go, go. But how this roster is constructed at every level from the major league down to the minors, it's not win now at the end of the day. And, and that's the sad reality because you look at the roster really up the bottom and you think it can be a win now team. But there's just been nothing nothing since nearly two years now that has shown me it could be anything but mediocre. And I don't know if spending money is going to fix that at this point. I just don't. So here, here's where I, I disagree with it. We spent money. The previous respe- regime spent money on pieces that were definitively declining, you know, and they were hoping for a reinvention. Other teams, Spent smarter money, maybe a little, maybe even a little bit less, or maybe they had a few, you know, another year or two on a term, and it worked out. And the Phillies thought they were smarter than people. The Phillies and the Eagles operate in that same capacity, always thinking they're smarter than everyone else. Here we are. Entering this season, I will say that, like, if you would have said, like, pick a team, any team in baseball, who don't have an identity, are they winning right now? Are they built for the future? Are they built for a five years out future? You know, not even like a short term future, like a literally five more years of rebuild. And I would say I have no idea who this team is. But what I will say is the pieces that we have, the, the structure that we have in place now to get and acquire actual youthful talent, we're going to be fine. I genuinely believe that if it was still Clentac and company, we'd never have another blue chip prospect again legitimately we'd never have anything to be excited about we just have a bunch of dudes who we hope to god are going to work out i do believe that barber and company are going to be able to put that 
to rest and they're going to get us some pieces that we can be really fucking excited about. And we saw what they did in New York and here they are in Philly now. And in their first, they get Mick Abel who got a big arm right now. The kid's throwing 99 miles an hour and he's like 19. It's awesome. Good for him. Um, you know, I, I still, I believe in Bryson Stott. I, I, I don't, he's not going to be the sexiest of guys, but I believe in him. There's going to be enough here. And were you saying that you don't believe that you could spend money? What if you're spending the right money? What if you're finally making the right decision on these guys? Because it isn't Matt Klintak anymore. It's Dombrowski who has won everywhere that he goes. Yeah, but he, D- Dombrowski already – you bring back TD – and I, look, hindsight's twenty twenty here. The Gregorius signing was a move that I really wanted to happen, and I was so happy when they brought Didi back. I love Didi Gregorius. I talked about it earlier on the CTP pod, how much I like him, my expectations for him this season and whatnot. But it's been a pretty pretty down year for Didi Gregorius. He's taken a step back in every facet of the game, and he really looks like he's just on a downhill rapid decline where you really don't know what you're going to get out of him for the foreseeable future because the bat's been – inconsistent and the defense has been just fucking terrible um but like look like you've already seen moves like that where you're questioning decisions that have been made and i'm a fan like i I, like i could sit here and say how much i want td gregorius but like there are defensive metrics that point to him on the decline at least defensively and the offense on the offense side of things sure he had the two great years with new york but outside of the 60 game season um you haven't really seen much from from Didi offensively outside of those two really good years in the 60 game stretch last year, uh, but that move's already now in question. You don't know what else is going to come up and happen throughout the season. You don't know what he's still going to do that you'll question in the future. So I'm not completely sold on Dabrowski yet. I I do think he's the right guy for the right time, but like I'm not sold on him yet. I want to see what he does at the deadline before I think he could really uh right the ship right away. I think it's fair to, to be cautious, um, and I probably give him a little bit. And again, this is a guy that I did not want here. I'll, I'll be very honest about that. I did not want Dombrowski specifically because of the exit uh, that he has left and, and the situations he has left when he leaves. But the one thing that he leaves is at some point during his tenure, they were ultra competitive for many years. And I would give anything, anything anything literally anything i would give anything for competitive baseball in philadelphia (laughs) to know that we are playing playoff baseball postseason baseball in the city of philadelphia again and i believe that dombrowski has the ability to do it and that he will make the correct decisions and that he will utilize the pieces beneath him to say this is the smart play this is the guy that's that's still got something left. This is someone who was on the decline. I don't know what you're shaking your head at over there, man. Giants up 6-3 in the uh, top of the ninth. Gabe Kapler's on the cusp of winning his 25th game of the season. Well, I yeah, love Gabe Kapler. And the Mets are also beating the Braves. And I'm torn because I, I want both to lose. I always want both to lose. So I literally feel like that gif of uh, Jim Carrey where he's just like, ah, ah, on both <laughs> sides because he's got two arrows in his knees and he just, you know, doesn't know which one hurts more. Um, that's how I feel watching <laughs> watching uh, division rivals play each other that aren't the Phillies. That, so that's what I was shaking my head. Love it. Well, let's just take a look at that division real quick. So going into today – uh, the Phillies were only a half game out of first. They were uh, two games ahead of Atlanta and three of each Miami and Washington. Mets are, uh, again, in first place at 18 and 16. So the Mets look like a team that's starting to get themselves going. Uh, the Braves, by still on paper, in my opinion, are by far the most talented team in the division, at least up and down. Um, I don't, I don't shake your head over there at that. If you're about to say the Mets, I'm going to slap you through the computer. I, I would I would say it's the Mets right now, and I don't think that's I don't especially with with the only decent Braves starting to right now going down and um and um oh gosh what's his name I'm blanking on it did you see that though the guy he uh, broke his hand um the Brave starter he broke his hand uh punching no. a dugout wall yeah it's Good pretty for funny him. who the hell did that 
Oh, I think his name's like who to Oscar Hernandez or something like that. I'm so sorry. I hate pro- mispronouncing names like that. That's, That's definitely not it. But well, yeah, regardless, I, division as a whole right now still very tight. Divi- look, divisions up and down the league at this point are are pretty tight. Um, you know, and and that's kind of par for the course uh, in in the first couple months of of a season for teams really start to figure out who they are. And we're, we're approaching that time where, where we're going to have to start figuring out who we are. So hopefully the Philadelphia Phillies start answering some of the bells that we're putting up here on on uh, the So You Think You Can Manage podcast and some of the things that are are do we call them a sister pod or a brother pod? What do we call CTP? A pod that never puts out content. We'll call them that. The CTP pod. They may also talk about some of these things. Um, oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry for butchering this. Who Oscar you know? Uh, All right, then. Oh, I wow. Holy shit. I completely screwed the pooch on that. But uh, oh, he's yeah, pissed he off he didn't hit another grand slam. When did this even happen? I don't know how I missed that. I think I, I think it happened yesterday. I think I saw um, good old Bobby Nightingale tweeted out that it happened. That's so, uh, yeah, I mean, tough to see. Talented guy. <laughs> Like the Phillies made me really frustrated, so he, you know, he's good. Um, yes. Yeah, for sure. Well, we're 56 minutes in. I'm sure you're tired of hearing us, at least one of us speak. That one of us is probably me. The other one brings highly entertaining content every single time, and that's everyone's oh, favorite biscuit. You're too kind. Before we speak next time, we will have a our first series against the Marlins. That should just go splendidly. Uh, and then we go and we see Nick Pavetta and the Red Sox. I already feel sick to my stomach. I don't know. I don't know if we're if we're gonna see. And look, the Red Sox oh, right now have also have won 25 games, and they were supposed to suck. If so, we see Nick Pavetta and he just obliterates us, I think that's going to fulfill my my arc of turning into the Joker and live, oh, living oh. the life of crime. I'm all in, man. That's my favorite. That's <laughs> just my favorite character of anything in the history of time. Um, I love the Joker too. Oh, all in, absolutely all in. Uh, but we will have two uh, two series to talk with you about. Like I said, next time when we are back, uh, and we will be recording through probably the final innings of the second Marlin series. This one uh, be in Miami, which again should be splendid. This is the So You Think You Can Manage podcast. We certainly think we can. And at this point, we don't care who you are on the listening end. We believe in you, too, just so long as your name is not Joe Girardi. We will see you next week on the So You Think You Can Manage podcast. For Biscuit, I am Shane. And for Andrew, who is not here, miss you, pal. See you next week.